Paula Pete works here. So I have been hearing a lot of talk about Bonnie, and there's been a lot of controversy about her obtaining a Nika form. I think what people are missing is that this is a net boon for the Nika lore because now it's not so much about becoming a deity. It's getting back down to basics about what Nika stands for. And Nika is the warrior of liberation. Nika stands for freedom. And this is explained in this chapter because Bonnie realizes that Nika isn't some unobtainable deity or some figment of myth, right? All that is blown away. She equates Nika to being the most free. And that's how she obtains the form. She stops looking at Nika as a deity figure and starts looking at it as what she wants for herself. And she wants freedom for herself. That's why she envisions a future in which she is the most free. And that's what we've been seeing from Luffy since he started transforming into Gear 5th. It's the ability to fight how you want to fight. That's why this is so impactful, because now she has the freedom to be who she wants to be. She is now liberated. She understands now. That's why she flashes back to what Luffy said about Gear 5th. It's not about becoming a magical albino or whatever. It's about being the most free. That's the whole point. And I see a lot of people equating this to what Momonosuke did and they're not wrong but the difference here is that one you get a lot of immediate buildup from Momonosuke and I understand that and I think that's why people like that more than Bonnie but the advantage that Bonnie has over Momonosuke is that Bonnie's story extends far beyond a handful of arcs Bonnie's story at least extends up to Thriller Bark because now, based on the memory bubble stuff, she is intrinsically linked to Kuma. So anything he knows, she knows. On top of that, the connection isn't out of nowhere because we see her reacting in Shibori Archipelago as Marine Ford is happening. So with all that being said, I'm saying this isn't out of the blue. This was built up over nearly a decade really because any development kuma's got has been free development for bonnie so anytime kuma has been a significant factor in the straw hats journey it's been character development for bonnie which is kind of genius developing one character through the experiences of another character and i keep saying this over and over again anything that kuma has experienced bonnie has experienced also and here's a point that a lot of people forget. It's very telling that something was cooking because in Sabote Archipelago, who are we introduced to? The supernovas, obviously. But who are we also introduced to for the first time? The celestial dragons. Who has one of the most significant interactions with the celestial dragons other than Luffy, Zoro, and Bonnie? And then come to find out Bonnie is the illegitimate daughter of a celestial dragon, presumably. So from the start, Bonnie was connected to all this celestial dragon tomfoolery and always connected to Kuma. We just didn't have all the pieces at that time. But Egghead has been a great place to fill in all the blanks and i think oda has done an excellent job in doing all that but i think people forget that and another reason why i've championed her especially recently as a member of the crew because you had interactions with a straw hat very early on when bonnie prevented zoro from killing charlos i mean kizaro still showed up but still it's interesting that these things were planned so far ahead of time and you kind of got to look back and ask how much of this was coincidental and how much of this was planned. Based on all of these things being introduced in the same arc, I would argue that at least something was planned. Because when you look at the supernovas that we see, right, the ones who do stand out, who do get their own significant airtime are 
Law, Kid, and Bonnie. Capone doesn't. Hawkins doesn't. Killer does by extension of being a subordinate of Kid because you automatically equate him to Zoro and you're like, whoa. But it's really those three, Law, Kid, and Bonnie. The rest of them kind of get filled in at a later date. Capone famously, because Capone has the most developed crew out of any supernova other than like the Straw Hats right now with named characters that we know. Chiffon, Lola, the Risky Brothers, Pound, Monster Gun, Gotti. There are a lot of characters in Capone's cabinet. I'm just saying it's very interesting. And they all have unique designs when you compare them to like Kid. Kid's got what? Killer, Wire, Heat, and a bunch of punk rock guys with names, but they don't really matter. Law, same thing. Law's got Beppo. He does have John Bart. And then a bunch of other people in jumpsuits. But as far as supernovas go, there had to have been a plan for Bonnie at the very start. And what we get in Egghead fills in everything. And now there's even more context filled in because not only does she save Zoro from Charlos or Charlos from Zoro, but then she also gets to see what Luffy does to Charlos later on. So she knows that he too is against slavery, which is then compounded upon with the very spooky and daunting knowledge that she knows now about her mother being enslaved. It's a big character building thing, really. So I'm confused as to why people are so dismayed by her obtaining gear fifth. And then too, in terms of like power scaling, if you want to go into that which is the most boring part of the conversation but as far as Laura goes her distorted future does not last for a long time that's been the whole bit so she has worse stamina than Luffy in gear fifth on top of that when we see her go out to sea in the Kuma flashback she imitates gear third off of instinct so if that was ever a discrepancy I mean it was right there from the start and then what a lot of people don't point out is that her distorted future and when she becomes buff I mean it looks like Kuma but it also looks like gear 4 found man because they have a very similar build and then moving forward the idea of her becoming a revolutionary honestly it becomes more and more ridiculous to me also the thought of her dying which i've heard off and on is also kind of unrealistic because like i've said in my second year anniversary video you can kind of see who has a bunch of detail writing on them and who doesn't the age age fruit has been one of the most detailed devil fruits in the series thus far it's up there with law and big bomb in terms of capabilities so you would not put this much effort into an ability and have an ability not only be versatile but mean so much on a character building level to just throw it away up go on a ship with a bunch of pacifistas bye bonnie go off with revolutionaries bye bonnie it doesn't make any sense and then to the people who think that the revolutionaries have a bigger stake in her life than Nika, I would just like to remind you that one of the goals that she set for herself when going out to find Kuma was that she wanted to find Nika. So in the current story, she has both found her father and has found Nika. So she completed both original goals that she set out to do. That was the whole bit. That that was literally the whole thing. As far as revolutionaries go, if she wanted to join them, she would have joined them when she met Sabo and Mary Joas. But she left her father in the care of the revolutionaries as she went off to find Vegapunk for what he did to her father. But then, after collecting all the memories, she forgives Vegapunk because now she has the full story. And in having the full story, again, she knows that the Straw Hats stand for freedom. She knows that her father greatly respected the Straw Hats and has tested and helped them at least twice at very, very significant intervals. So why in the world 
would she become a revolutionary? Because the entire flashback is about the Straw Hats in the latter half once he becomes a warlord. Once Kuma becomes a warlord, the revolutionary army stuff takes an immediate backseat. The revolutionary army stuff is only at the start and then it is gone. And then you get like glimpses of him helping the revolutionary army that he leaves or he signs over guinea's position to bello betty but it's never like that's at the forefront towards the end where the canon it comes into play and where things matter and what you see events from his point of view that's all him helping the main characters but another argument is that she would become the revolutionary army's new guinea which has some terrible, terrible connotations that I don't want to get into. But you got to remember, before she was a revolutionary army member, she was a sister of Nika. She started a life with Kuma in the church dedicated to Nika, and she passed away holding a baby body in the church of Nika, where Kuma declares in that same church that he will raise bonnie up properly and that's the memory that we see kuma presumably fade away on as he's looking up at luffy and bonnie both in gear fifth so if you ask me it seems like nika mattered to guinea a little more than the revolutionary army that's just a guess but with that being said i think to honor her mother what might be a cute touch is that when she does join the straw hat crew she gets a slight design change in which she adopts guinea's haircut probably usopp or robin cuts her hair because it is very interesting that we do see guinea as a child and as an adult and then when bonnie activates her fruit for the first time everyone remarks on how much she looks like guinea so i think to complete the transformation she would get a haircut at least that's what i think because the haircut that guinea has is very unique so i don't think that's a design that's going to be thrown away and it will bring everything to a nice full circle but anyway give me your thoughts